Welcome. Welcome. I see some brand new faces and I see some familiar faces. Um, but we want to thank you all for joining us today. My name is Donna True. I am a licensed clinical social worker here at the Kane Center. And I'm the program development and outreach coordinator here. Is anybody here today for the very first time ever? Raise your hand. Oh, wow. Wow. That's fantastic. We appreciate all of you very much. Those of you who are new for the very first time and those who have been here before. Um, Dr. Dalby has been here to speak to us before, and I know he always draws a great crowd because he's a great speaker. So, just to let you know a little bit about the Kane Center, we're actually the Council on Aging of Martin County at the Kane Center, and we provide many different services and programs, including fun and engaging activities, as well as supervised care. Did you know we prepare over 500 meals daily right here in our kitchen and our wonderful volunteers deliver them. It's the Meals on Wheels program. I don't know if you knew that. We have a full primary care medical practice, which is at the next set of doors down, Day Medical Center. And also with Day Medical Center's Brain Matters Research right here in our building. And just so you know, you don't have to live in Martin County to take care, to take advantage of our services. Today's presentation is being recorded. This is, we have some people that are joining us on Zoom, I think. And this recording will be available on our website later, as long as all our technology cooperates. But you'll be able to watch it again if you want to. So for those of you who are joining us on Zoom, just please know this is a webinar. This is basically like watching something on your TV. We cannot see you and we cannot hear you. So if your doorbell rings or your dog starts barking, it's okay, we can't hear you. You're not gonna interrupt us. Your cameras and microphones are off. Just a little housekeeping note. We have restrooms right outside the doors. Men's room is to the left and the ladies room is to the right. And then there's a family restroom as well to the left. And if you could, if you have your phone ringers on, it would be great if you can turn your phone ringer off. If you need them on, you can leave it on, but we prefer that they're off just so we don't disrupt the speaker. One thing I wanted to ask you, did you know we have a nutritionist here at the Kane Center? And because with Dr. Dowdy's topic being diet, exercise, and motivation, I figured I'd better check with our nutritionist before I picked up any snacks at all. So the snacks on the table have been recommended. We do have more, we have more water, so don't hesitate if you need to try out a snack, go ahead and try it out. But they come from her suggestions and ideas. But there's one thing, you have to keep a secret. Do not tell Dr. Dalby that my idea of a balanced diet is a cookie in each hand. Don't tell them though. Okay, as a nonprofit organization, we could not survive without the support of our sponsors and donors. So we consider our sponsors who are set up at the table in the back as resources for you. We wanna thank Elite Home Care, Home Health Care, and I'm looking for Suzanne. Suzanne's over there waving her hand. Her material is on the back table. Yeah, she's wearing green. We want to thank Nightingale Private Care with Mary Beth and in the back. Yes, thank you so much. You can't miss them. And Senior Helpers, who I don't see here yet today, but they're a friend of the King sponsor here today. Um, Caregiver Counselor Laura Kramer, sitting over on the side, raised her hand. She passed out her new support group flyers, brand new, hot off the press. So if you're interested in a support group for Parkinson's, it's going to be meeting right down the road at, at one of the facilities. So at the very end, after Dr. Dalby speaks, we have some, uh, at least we have the beautiful orchid is gonna be a dork prize. It's gonna be a drawn by Nightingale. And we also want you to know about our free weekly Parkinson's exercise class. We had flyers on the front desk and we have flyers on the back table. All you have to do is show up tomorrow at three o'clock. 
And we have a therapist who does the exercise classes every week for free for you. And we get a lot of very good feedback on that. Now, I would like to introduce two people real quickly. One is not going to come up here to talk, but Michelle Jacobs is here. And Michelle, did you want to say something today? Okay. If you want to make a donation, see her. Um, and then we have Phyllis Waters Brown, RN, who is the director of our daycare. Phyllis, I'd like you to come up and tell people a little bit about what you do at the club here. Hi, everyone. My name is Phyllis. I'm the director of the Adult Day Medical Center. What we do is try to keep people in their homes for as long as they can stay independently there. So you will come in, we open at 7.30 in the morning, Monday through Friday, we close at 5. So you come in, we have breakfast, then we break you up into cognitive groups, and we, mo we mostly stimulate that brain. Some of us think it's gone to sleep, it's still awake. We just have to exercise it a little bit, so we do quite a bit of that. We also do chair exercise. We play games, we do puzzles, we take field trips, we laugh at each other. Um, there's a lot of socialization that goes on, but if you would like to give it a try, just give us a call. You can come in for one day, give it a try. If you like it, come back and join us. If not, tell me what you did not like so I can improve that. I think that's about it. Thanks so much. Thank you, Phyllis. And then we have literature on the back table with our phone number, but our main number is the 223-7800, telephone number area code 772. And you can always reach Phyllis or any of us through that main number. We're happy to do anything we can to help or give you information. We also have a navigator here who I did not mention yet, but Jeannie Kenny is our navigator. So if you're trying to figure out what services or what help you can get, you can speak with Jeannie as well. So again, thank you, Phyllis, very much. And now a little bit about Dr. Arif Dalby. He is a board-certified neurologist. He specializes in Parkinson's disease and other movement disorders. He is with Palm Beach Neuroscience Institute and with the Memory Disorder Center. His offices are on Village Boulevard in West Palm and also in Boynton Beach. He has conducted research for many years and was awarded the Doctor of Excellence Award by the Estonia Medical Research Foundation. He was formerly the director of the Neurology Residency Program at the University of Chicago, Pritzker School of Medicine. He's fellowship trained in Parkinson's disease from Columbia University in New York. His research interests have included novel treatments such as deep brain stimulation and nerve growth factors. And if I got any of this, if I'm off, I know you'll correct it for me. Dr. Dalby has published widely on Parkinson's disease in a number of peer reviewed journals, including the Journal of Neurosurgery. We absolutely love it when Dr. Dalby can get time away from his very busy schedule and join us here at the Kane Center. And without further ado, I'm going to hand the microphone over to Dr. Dalby. I'm going to turn on his slide Thank you, Donna, for a very kind introduction. I'm going to do the ritual of taking off the mask for a second. <laughs> So it is wonderful to see people in person. I think uh, everyone is uh, somewhat exhausted from this pandemic that has lasted longer than anybody anticipated. And I think we all feel the disconnect. So it is nice that we have people actually meeting in person and uh, treating <laughs> each other uh, and learning from each other. But we have learned lessons from the pandemic, so we are also broadcasting on Zoom and then later on YouTube. So we, we have learned a few useful lessons from the pandemic uh, in terms of how to reach people and give them more information about Parkinson's and other uh, conditions that we speak about. 
Uh, today's talk is going to be a little bit different from my usual presentations. I tend to focus a lot on medications for Parkinson's. Uh, surgical treatment is my special area of expertise with deep brain stimulation and other techniques. And I might towards the end mention uh, a new technique called focused ultrasound as well. But today I wanted to focus on a holistic approach to Parkinson's disease. So if you look at it, uh, we cannot address the problem of Parkinson's disease just with medications, just with surgical treatments alone. We really need to have an all-inclusive uh, all approach that includes uh, diet, it includes exercise, it includes uh, other uh, modalities as well. And the goals of this all-inclusive approach are going to be uh, in, in terms of physical improvements, whether it is with respect to walking, balance, mobility, but also because Parkinson's is such a complicated condition, we also want to try to maintain the cognitive function of the patient we want to maintain the mood of the patient. We want to maintain the social engagements of the patients. And also we try to address non-motor symptoms, anything from blood pressure drops when you stand up to things like constipation or a sleep disorder. So there's a whole range of things that we have to address when we are looking at Parkinson's disease. I'm actually going to move a bit here so I can see what the slide is about. One thing to keep in mind is there is no substitute for medications. And when I mention medications, even today in 2022, the gold standard medication is levodopa. But as I mentioned, there are approaches that can supplement the medications that can complement the medications, including diet and exercise. So we're going to go through a few questions. Number one, is there a diet that works for Parkinson's? Is there a best diet for Parkinson's disease? One question often comes up is this issue of protein in the diet and how it affects medications. The other issue is which exercise should I do for Parkinson's disease, which will help me the most? Is there a best exercise that is recommended? So in terms of the diet, a number of things have been looked at, but in the recent years, I would say in the past two to five years, there's been a lot of focus on this diet called the MIND diet, M-I-N-D. So it is the Mediterranean Dash Intervention for Neurodegenerative Delay. Uh, quite a mouthful, but basically it is a diet that combines two diets in one. One is the Mediterranean diet itself, and the second is a heart healthy diet called the DASH diet that helps keep your blood pressure low by uh, especially keeping a keen eye on how much sodium is in the diet. So combining these two gives us the MIND diet. So take a look at this slide. It gives you the essence of what is the MIND diet. So you have whole grains, you have berries, you have beans, green leafy vegetables, poultry, nuts, uh, and uh, especially uh, one of the things that is protective is uh, fish of uh, certain kinds and one glass of wine, but not more. So that's the important thing. Just as important as what is included is to remember what is excluded. So you really, really want to avoid processed foods. You want to avoid, um, you know, your sweets, your pastries. You want to minimize some of the uh, uh, non whole grain type of carbohydrates that you might consume. You want to avoid red meat. You want to avoid excessive uh, alcohol intake. So it's both a diet that favors certain food groups and a diet that recommends that you avoid these groups. And what we have found in study after study is that this sort of a diet can have not exactly a neuroprotective effect in terms of uh, pathology that has not been measured, but clinically we find that people who are most adherent to these diets tend to have a lower rate of progression of neurodegenerative, uh, neurodegenerative conditions, whether it is Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease. So what might be the mechanism why the mind diet helps? So one reason is it, it tends to favor plant-based. So it's not a vegetarian diet, let alone a vegan diet, 
but it is quite heavily plant-based. And plant-based diets in general, they reduce oxidative stress. One interesting fact about the substantia nigra, which is the area in the brain where most of the pathology is located, the substantia nigra, the dark substance, that's the area where dopamine is made. This is an area of the brain that has a very high level of oxidative stress. And in part, the cell death and the progression of Parkinson's might be explained by the high level of oxidative stress. So being on a plant-based diet, it reduces oxidative stress and that's why it might be helpful. Now, one of the uh, important nutrients included in the diet or foods included in the diet are things like berries, uh, which contain a lot of substances called flavonoids. And these flavonoids, again, have an antioxidant effect that can be very helpful. Green leafy vegetables have ca ca carotenoids, which also help uh, reduce inflammation in, in the brain and oxidative stress in the brain. One symptom of Parkinson's very common is constipation. In fact, it can even precede the first tremor, the first slowness of movement by many years. Uh, and it's very much uh, one of the troublesome non-motor symptoms in Parkinson's disease. And having the high fiber through the whole brains can be very helpful in, in terms of regulating bowels. So that's again, part of the MIND diet. The poultry in the diet, as opposed to uh, red meat, uh, the diet prefers poultry, but the poultry is helpful in providing B vitamins and the fatty fish like salmon, can provide omega-3, which is uh, helpful for brain health. You can also look at olive oil, which is a part of the Mediterranean diet and the mind diet. It has polyphenols, again, antioxidants that can protect the brain. So a whole range of um, uh, improvements are related to the ingredients in the food. And the final uh, ingredient comes from red wine, again, having some antioxidant properties. Again, it's important to remember that Parkinson's kills brain cells, alcohol also kills brain cells. So there's a U-shaped curve. If you have a glass of red wine, it's probably going to be helpful. If you're having two or three glasses of red wine, not so helpful. So when you look at the data in terms of evidence-based medicine, again, there's a whole range of papers that are out there looking at both Parkinson's disease, looking at Alzheimer's disease, looking at longevity in general. Uh, the MIND diet has been shown many times over to be uh, associated with a slower rate of progression uh, as opposed to uh, other sorts of diets. And the other advantage of the MIND diet is that it is almost a lifestyle change. It's not a fad diet. There are some diets that people might be on, let's say, to lose weight rapidly. They might be on a keto diet. That's not a diet you can sustain long term. A mind diet you can eat for the rest of your life, and you know it's just part of the lifestyle. It's a healthy lifestyle as opposed to a diet per se. So keep that in mind in terms of planning your diet and your meals. Now, if you look at one question I'm often asked by patients is, how should I time my medication? Should I take my levodopa with food or before food or after food? Uh, what about protein? Should I stop eating protein in the diet? Uh, if you stop eating protein in the diet, you'll get a terrible sort of malnutrition that's called partial core. So you absolutely want to include protein in the diet, whether it is plant-based protein or animal-based protein or both. One concern is that if you look at the breakdown products of protein through your diet, they're broken down into amino acids. And for those amino acids to go from your gut into your bloodstream, there's a transport of protein that's involved that picks up those amino acids. That same transport of protein is involved with picking up the levodopa. So just like, you know, if there's a bus stop full of people, some people are going to be left behind. So if you have a lot of protein in your food and you're taking levodopa at the same time, at least in theory, it's possible that some of the levodopa will be left behind. So how much should you be aware of this and how much should you stress over this? I have patients who really are becoming nervous wrecks because they're worried about, especially once you go from a twice a day or three times a day regimen to four or five times a day that some patients will need, 
They get so nervous about meal times with food, without food, protein, no protein. This is a nice paper. Uh, two of my former mentors at Columbia are uh, the senior authors on this, Claire Ford and Paul Green. They actually looked at how much of an impact protein in the diet has in terms of availability of levodopa. And the good news is it's only somewhere between 5% to 12% of patients who are going to have this as a real issue. What I tell patients in my own practice is that for the most part, try to follow your levodopa according to clock times. So depending on when you wake up and so on, and let's say you're doing four times a day, just go seven, 11, three and seven, or eight, 12, four and eight. Put those four timings on your cell phone. When the alarm rings, take the medication with food, without food, don't worry about this too much. If you're in that group that is protein sensitive as it's, it's so called, you will know. And if you see that, you know, consistently, every time you have a high protein meal, the next dose of levodopa is not working so well, then certainly you should pay a little more attention to it and time the medications in, in a way that there will be uh, not so much of an interference. But most patients do not need to stress over this. So uh, just relax a bit about this question because I see patients needlessly aggravating over this to the point where the anxiety makes their symptoms worse, not so much the protein in the diet. So that is one point I wanted to bring out uh, today. Now, the other issue uh, which we often talk about with our patients in terms of a holistic approach is increasing the level of activity, increasing exercise. Everybody, whether they have Parkinson's disease or not, needs exercise. Exercise is helpful from a cardiovascular standpoint. Exercise is helpful from a brain standpoint. Exercise is a preventive in so many ways. Uh, I, I like to joke that if I could bottle exercise in the form of a pill and sell it, um, you know, I would be uh, probably a, a reasonably wealthy man, if not a very wealthy man. But unfortunately, there's no way to do that. You actually have to do the exercise. But one of the challenges in Parkinson's is that if you look at the whole NDR stages, which are documenting the severity of Parkinson's disease, especially once you start to cross into stage three, stage four, the level of activity drops quite a bit, let alone exercise, just the level of activity tends to drop a bit. And there are many reasons for this. And um, let's go over some of the reasons and also look at approaches we can have in terms of improving your motivation, improving your ability, ability to exercise, and so on. So some of the reasons why it is harder for somebody with Parkinson's to exercise than somebody who is their age group but doesn't have Parkinson's. Dopamine, which is low in the brain and Parkinson's, is one of the major ways in which we get motivation. It is the motivation molecule in the brain. Now, if you're having low levels of dopamine, then the ability to do new things, to venture out, to do things that are a little harder than your baseline, it becomes so much more challenging, which is one of the reasons why patients with Parkinson's, uh, it's very, very hard sometimes to get them motivated enough, even to go to a physical therapy session, let alone do regular exercise. Depression is very common with Parkinson's. Just like I mentioned, constipation can precede the diagnosis of Parkinson's, by a number of years. Depression can precede the diagnosis of Parkinson's by a number of years. It's not so much a person saying, I have Parkinson's, so I'm depressed, but just like there's low levels of dopamine in the brain, there's low levels of serotonin in the brain and other uh, changes that reflect uh, a chemical imbalance that leads to depression. So again, uh, apathy, anhedonia, lack of interest in things uh, are again more common with Parkinson's disease. And then there is a simple challenge of the physical difficulties. Uh, the muscles become stiff. You have to burn that many more calories to push through a stiff muscle than you otherwise would. You get fatigued, you get tired much more easily. Uh, balance becomes a problem, which again uh, makes you nervous about doing exercises and certainly certain exercises are, would not be recommended if you're having a lot of difficulty with balance. So there's a whole range of issues with Parkinson's itself and then added on to that might be general issues like arthritis and so on, which add to the challenge further. 
So a whole range of reasons why it's not the easiest. I can recommend exercise to my Parkinson's patients and they might intellectually understand the need for that exercise, but to carry out that, that recommendation and practice is often not the easiest uh, thing in the world. So we have to find ways to trick the brain, so to speak, to kind of fool the brain into starting out exercise programs in such a way that allows to begin, which is the most important step, and then gradually increase. So the one thing I recommend to my patients is if you had a goal of walking a mile a day, break that goal into tiny pieces, throw it away somewhere. Just aim to walk to the next house and back. That's it. So make a much lower goal, set the bar much lower than you originally were anticipating. The second thing is, let's say you are really tired the next day and you don't even want to walk to that next house. You know, be, be, it's okay, take a break. Don't, don't go for a walk that day. So it's okay to cheat a bit on, on that exercise, but try not to cheat on the frequency of the exercise. So the day that you're unable to walk outside, try to make a few rounds around the house, keep that mobility going. So it's okay to cheat on the intensity of the exercise, but it is not okay to cheat on the frequency of the exercise. So try to keep that, that exercise routine going. So Jerry Seinfeld, he uh, was asked one day, you know, when his show was at its peak, how, how is it that you're able to come up with new jokes for your show all the time, all the time? So he said, you know, I have a very simple trick that I do, to, uh, which is I have a calendar that I put on the wall and every day I have to write at least one joke. So if I write that joke, I get a mark a big X on that calendar. If I don't, I draw a sad face. So this was his scheme. It, he called it the streak. Uh, these days, if you look at the teenagers, they're all about maintaining Snapchat streaks with their friends. They will share photos and try to keep the streak every day. The reason why they're hooked to doing that is that streak is raising your dopamine level. That's how uh, these social media devices are, are um, getting our teenagers to use them so frequently. Same thing goes with trying to fool the brain into doing more exercise than you otherwise would. Try to maintain the streak. It doesn't matter if you haven't walked the mile. It's okay if you just walk to the next house. It doesn't matter if you weren't able to walk to the next house. Just walk around the house, but get to that X being marked out on your calendar. Technology can be very helpful. So having a Fitbit on your wrist or having an Apple Watch on your wrist, it gives you a reminder, you know, how many steps you've done. Is your circle complete or not? Things of that sort. It'll give you reminders at certain times of the day. You now have to stand. You haven't stood for a while, so stand up, move around. So use technology in, in the right way to, to kind of remind you to, to do exercise. And uh, believe in the power of compound interest. If you ask Albert Einstein and Warren Buffett to agree on one thing, the one thing they would agree on is the power of compound interest. So even if you start really slow, you haven't been used to exercising for many, many years and you're starting really, really slow, just do one or two percent better the next time. Do one or two percent better the next time. Even if you're doing one percent better in by the rule of 72, those who are interested in finance will know this rule. In 72 days, you're going to be twice as good. So aim for those gradual, slight improvements rather than setting goals that are not going to be realistic. Just push through little by little to where you get comfortable with it and then that level of comfort then will serve as a baseline for the next level of achievement. So believe in, in compound interest and again, maintain that streak as much as you can. So one of the things that has been looked at more recently in research uh, is how does exercise actually help in, in Parkinson's disease? And one of the reasons why it's challenging to do is Exercise is not an easy entity to study in an objective scientific way. So for example, uh, when we do clinical trials uh, with our surgical program, we often have patients come in first thing in the morning, we tell them don't take any cinnamon or any levodopa overnight. And when they come in first thing in the morning, they're slow, they're stiff, they have more tremor. 
And then we give them their levodopa and wait 40 minutes, an hour, and then the levodopa kicks in. And there's a clear cut, no questions asked improvement. With exercise, you're not looking at an overnight change. You're looking at exercise that has to be done consistently for a long period of time for it to show as a positive benefit, uh, and which is why it's hard to do research that is controlled and uh, validated in, in the field of exercise. But more and more uh, different institutions are looking at this, and one of the things that they have been looking at is, for example, if you divide patients into those who almost never exercise, those who exercise occasionally, those who exercise fairly frequently, and those who are regular exercises. If you compare them in terms of their progression over two years using rating scales like the whole NPR scale or the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, across the board, you will see that the group that exercises the most is going to have the slowest progression in terms of their Parkinson's disease. So there is a, a host of evidence, not just the common sense, view of exercise being helpful, but more and more we're establishing evidence from control studies that exercise is a key part of the treatment of Parkinson's just as much as levodopa is a key part of the treatment of Parkinson's. So what are the goals of exercise and Parkinson's? Uh, when you're in your 20s, you know, you might have a goal to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, so that's a different goal. When you're having Parkinson's disease, you're doing exercise, but your goal is something completely different. So some of the goals that we aim for, one is uh, endurance, uh, which is through aerobic exercise, strength training, balance, flexibility, and sometimes uh, we will also look into functional uh, abilities, uh, and sometimes this can be done through occupational therapy, for example. So it's a different set of goals that we're looking to accomplish with respect to exercise and Parkinson's disease. Now, no two patients are alike with Parkinson's. So I, I tell my patients, you know, go to support groups, you know, get engaged, understand what is going on in the world of Parkinson's, both in terms of present day treatments, as well as in terms of upcoming research, but avoid comparing notes because when you compare how your Parkinson's is doing with that of your friend with Parkinson's right next to you, it's going to be completely different. Even though the overall condition is the same, there is so much variation in terms of symptoms, in terms of severity, in terms of rate of progression, in terms of whether cognition is involved or not. Many, many factors. So don't compare notes, but get as much information as, as you can about the condition. One of the things that I recommend very, very early, probably sooner than most neurologists, is physical therapy. So I like patients with Parkinson's to start with physical therapy almost in, in the visit after their diagnosis, or certainly as soon as possible, because it's not just about improving things, but about maintaining a functional uh, level. And the sooner you start with physical therapy, the, the better it tends to be in terms of uh, the disease state progression uh, clinically. The other advantage of being engaged with a physical therapist very early in the course of things is they can help you plan out an exercise regimen. They can measure out what you're doing. They can assess your balance. They can assess what is safe for you to do and what is not so safe for you to do. So work with your physical therapist in terms of defining a plan Check with your um, neurologist as well and see if it is a feasible plan for you in terms of where you are in your disease state progression. And that way you can choose uh, the best exercise plan for yourself. Few exercises I'm going to recommend um, because I think really, as I mentioned, one of the goals, if, if anything, if I have to state what is the one goal of exercise and Parkinson's disease, I would say that one goal is to prevent the fall. Because inevitably, once the patient has their first fall, they tend to decline more rapidly after that. So we want to reduce the risk of falling. And one of the things that you can do in terms of reducing the risk of falling is focus on exercises that improve your lower body strength and that improve your balance. So this exercise is called the farmer's walk. 
If you look at farmers, they carry these bales full of things and they're heavy and they're walking with them. And you can replicate the farmer's walk with dumbbells or kettlebells. The idea is if you look at the number of muscles that are activated by holding those dumbbells, it's really a whole range of core muscles and lower body muscles are activated. It also, even though the weight is held in the hand, it's transmitted through your spinal cord down to your legs. So it's also very good in terms of reducing the risk of things like osteopenia and vertebral fractures because you're putting some stress on your spine that then strengthens the bone as well as the muscles. So focus on lower body strength. Now, obviously this young man is carrying what looks like a 30 or 40 pound dumbbell. I would not recommend that to my Parkinson's patients. You can start again, set the bar very low, start with you know, five uh, pound weights or uh, start with 10 pound weights if you feel stronger. And then depending on how you're doing with that, you can increase the weights. One thing you can do is put those weights where you see them. So whenever you see them, pick them up, do a round around the house. So that way you're constantly engaging. Don't think of it so much as exercise, going to the gym, but really improving your mobility, improving your strength on an ongoing and constant basis. The second exercise, I think, uh, Again, something that can, can and probably should be done every day is a tree pose that you can modify because with Parkinson's, your balance is not going to be to the point where you can do the classic yoga tree pose, but you can just lean onto a chair and try and see how well your balance does and little by little try to improve on the balance. So this is again a very simple thing that you can do on a, on a daily basis and that will help maintain your balance and reduce the risk of fall. Another very simple thing, the, uh, there's no chair in the diagram, uh, it's just pointing out the muscles that are involved, core muscles, quads, glutes, and hamstrings. But again, just sitting and standing in your chair five times or 10 times, uh, whenever you remember, that's another way of improving your core strength, your lower body strength, reducing the risk of fall. So this is just a list of three. As I said, you know, talk to your physical therapist. They're going to be wonderful guides in terms of planning out an exercise regimen for you. Not just while you're doing the therapy in the clinic, but things you can carry out at home as well as a maintenance therapy. Now, another question is often asked is, what about supplements? Which supplements should I take? And uh, there's a whole host of things that you sometimes run into on television, for example. Uh, Prevagen uh, is advertised very heavily for memory issues. People with Parkinson's also have memory issues. But the one thing you have to note in that ad of Prevagen is at the very end, it says this compound has not been shown to diagnose, treat, or cure any disease. This has not been approved by the FDA. And uh, I, I'd like to say uh, only half in jest to people who say, what about Prevagen? I say, look, it's made from jellyfish. Jellyfish are the dumbest creatures known to man, and how is that going to make you smile? So just think about that the next time you see an ad like that. So the gold standard research in, in terms of estimating whether an intervention is helpful or not is called the randomized control trial. So we have half of the patients getting placebo, half of the patients getting actual drug. The person who's rating the patient does not know what they're on but follow them for a period of time and then measure things. So I actually had experience with coenzyme Q10 and a similar antioxidant uh, compound called CEP1347 in two clinical trials um, that I will mention in just a bit. Other things that have been looked at, vitamin E, creatine, uh, green tea polyphenols. There's a very interesting compound called mucuna pruriens that I will talk about as well. But let me tell you my experience with uh, CEP1347, which is, again, the theory was that it reduces cell death, it reduces oxidative stress, apoptosis, such mechanisms, and so reduces cell death. Again, when we did a large scale study, including clinical exams, imaging techniques to estimate the level of progression, we found that the placebo group and the treated group were pretty much equal. There, there was no real difference between them. So there's very little value to this compound uh, in terms of a neuroprotective effect. Coenzyme Q10, uh, 
This is a very popular antioxidant. Uh, a lot of people take 100 milligrams, uh, 200 milligrams of coenzyme Q10 every day. The theory is sound that it's an antioxidant. But what happens when you test the theory with a proper randomized control trial? So initially, there were smaller studies looking at doses like 300 milligrams, 600, 900, and 1200 milligrams. And the 1200 milligram group seemed to show that it was separating out from the other groups, meaning it had a chance of being neuroprotective. So when I was at the University of Chicago, I was involved with this trial uh, with coenzyme Q10, and we used industrial strength coenzyme Q10, not the 100 or 200. We used 1,200 milligrams. We used 2,400 milligrams as the two groups that we compared with placebo. Again, unfortunately, we found that the placebo group actually did slightly better than the control groups. So again, uh, you know, the theories are all sound. Uh, there's a lot of uh, push in, uh, in terms of uh, supplement manufacturers and so on to use these kind of compounds. But whatever money you will save on not buying these supplements, spend on improving the diet and spend on getting the highest quality ingredients for your diet. That'll be money much better spent than chasing the next best supplement because there is none. Mucuna prurience is, uh, is very interesting. There is a textbook of Indian medicine compiled somewhere between uh, 800 BC to 500 BC, so thousands of years ago. And in that textbook, they describe a disease which in Sanskrit is called tampabad, which means shaking palsy. Interestingly, the, the book that gave rise to uh, the term Parkinson's disease was written by Sir James Parkinson's in the 1800s, and he called it an essay on the shaking policy. So the Kampavat in, in the Ayurvedic literature was treated, and even today is treated with this herbal medication called Nukuna Purines. Reason why people in uh, places like India will use herbal medication is even cinnamon, which is generic and relatively cheap, for some folks in India, even that generic cinema can be very expensive. So they go to the local Ayurvedic physician and they get this herbal medication, which is a lot cheaper than generic cinnamon. Now, somebody actually analyzed Nukuna prurians to find out what is the active ingredient. And what they found was, can you guess what the active ingredient might be in this herbal medication? So the answer is levodopa. So, <laughs> 600 BC, you know, they were using this compound, which works because it has levodopa in it. Now, would you take this as a supplement or would you take it as a substitute for levodopa? There are some issues with that. And the issue is whether you take levodopa as a tablet or whether you take levodopa as a herbal powder, uh, having Nukuna prurians, ultimately it's how much levodopa that counts. It's not safer or less safe because it comes from a pharmacy as opposed to a supplement shop. What we find is when we actually estimate the effect of mucuna prurience, it's sort of like taking a one-eighth tablet or one-tenth tablet of levodopa. So guess what? You're going to have much less side effects because you're taking only one-tenth of a tablet. So again, these compounds, when they are given to you through uh, as a supplement, the FDA does not regulate them the same way that the FDA regulates cinnamon or regulates carbidopa, levodopa. So while it is interesting, while the concept is sound, while it works exactly the same way as the best gold standard medication, levodopa works, uh, it's really not going to be a particular advantage to take it as a supplement as opposed to taking it as a prescription medication. But I thought I would mention it because there's a lot of interest in quote unquote natural treatments. So here's a natural treatment that does work and it works because it has the same ingredient that we use to treat Parkinson's as the gold standard treatment, which is levodopa. I'm going to switch gears a bit because I'm really excited about this new project. It's called Focused Ultrasound. So we are at Palm Beach Neuroscience Institute. We are collaborating with a company out of Israel called Insight Tech. And what we are trying to do is look at focused ultrasound as a treatment for Parkinson's and as a treatment for tremor. 
The idea is when you have low levels of dopamine in the brain, certain pathways in the brain, they're called the direct and indirect pathways, they go out of sync. And what happens is that uh, because they're out of sync, you can have things like slowness of movement, muscle stiffness. Uh, there might even be tremor cells in those areas of the brain that cause the tremor that you see. So until today, uh, we have been using deep brain stimulation, which has been um, FDA approved, which has been Medicare approved as a surgical treatment for people with Parkinson's who are not responding adequately to medical treatment. So deep brain stimulation is uh, the, the go-to surgical treatment for Parkinson's. But the challenge with deep brain stimulation is you have to drill a pore hole, you have to put a wire in, you have to put a pacemaker in. So what we're trying to do with focused ultrasound is to impact that same area of the brain, but do it with a technique that doesn't require an incision. So there is no pore hole. There's not even an incision in, on, on your brain. In fact, even though it is brain surgery, you don't even go to an operating room. So the whole procedure is performed in an MRI suite, not in an operating room. This technique, by the way, I call it old wine in new, uh, rather new wine in old bottles, because we used to do, uh, when I started out at uh, Columbia Presbyterian, as a fellow there, we were doing a technique called thalamotomy and thalidotomy, where we, we would make a lesion in the brain, which is basically making a small control stroke in the brain in an area that is overactive to control symptoms. But over time, we realized that deep brain stimulation is a much more safe way of doing it. And also deep brain stimulation can be done on both sides of the brain much more safely than making a lesion in the brain. So pallidotomy and thalamotomy fell out of favor. And the other issue is with pallidotomy, you still do need to make a burr hole. You still need to put a probe in the brain and then you make a lesion. But with this new technique, we are able to offer the benefits of pallidotomy and thalamotomy without uh, the need for a borehole, which has been a big uh, change. So this is something that now we have already done research on and it has been FDA approved. And in fact, if you have essential tremor or if you have tremor predominant Parkinson's disease, this is an FDA approved technique. It is also Medicare approved in the state of Florida. So if you have regular Medicare, it's something that uh, it, uh, has been approved for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. We did this study uh, called PD006, where we looked at a different target in the brain, not so much just for control of tremor, but for control of overall symptoms of Parkinson's for patients who had on-off fluctuation or dyskinesias. Uh, the target in the brain was not the thalamus, but the globus pallidus. This trial was called uh, PD006, again, it was sponsored by InsightTech. It was only one side of the brain. So let's say your right side was more affected. We operated on the left side of the brain because the wires in the brain are crossed. Left brain controls right side. We chose patients who had uh, fluctuations and dyskinesias uh, with respect to their medication response. And we are continuing to follow them. So I'm still following these patients as part of research for a total of five years. We are already, uh, many of our patients have completed two years as part of this trial. We did submit the one year data to the FDA and, and uh, the data was substantially positive, which led to FDA approval. So now this target in the brain with focused ultrasound has been FDA approved so that we can offer it to patients, not just with tremor predominant Parkinson's, but overall Parkinson's and uh, we are awaiting on Medicare approval uh, of this target as well. Uh, this is uh, a slide that I am, um, uh, I, I'd like to show in terms of uh, the way uh, we uh, collaborated on this project. The centers, uh, as you can see, they're some of the absolute best in the world in terms of neurology and neurosurgery research in places like uh, UPenn, you have places like Stanford, OSU, you have places out of Israel, you have places out of Europe. But guess who is number one in terms of uh, recruitment for this trial? It's our group at Palm Beach Neuroscience Institute by far. So you'd have to add two of the other 
major university institutions to come up with our experience in terms of doing this. Since then, we have gone on to do a lot of these procedures for patients, even outside research in terms of essential tremor and tremor predominant Parkinson's. So we gathered a ton of experience with this new technique. As I mentioned, this study was a seminal pivotal study in that it allowed us to present information to the FDA that has now led to approval of this target in the brain. And we're hoping later this year we will get approval from Medicare as well so that we can offer it to patients with Parkinson's who are not having an adequate response to medications. Typically, if you have Parkinson's for five years or more, you're uh, taking levodopa doses four times a day, five times a day, and even so, your medication goes on and off. You're having tremor that is not well controlled. You're having dyskinesias come through. You're having a lot of trouble with shuffling of gait and so on, or muscle rigidity. This would be a, a procedure to consider uh, for such patients. Now, we are actually, I signed off on this uh, last Friday. We are in the process of recruiting for a second study in this regard, it's called PD014. And what we are looking to do with this trial is not just offer it for patients who have predominantly one-sided symptoms. This trial will be offered for patients who have symptoms on both sides of the body because we are going to operate on both sides of the brain in a staged fashion uh, in PD014. Again, if you have Parkinson's for five years or more, if you're having motor fluctuations where the medication does not last from one dose to the next, if you're having involuntary movements or dyskinesia, if you're tremor, no matter how much levodopa you throw at it, it's, it remains medically intractable. Talk to us about the procedure and evaluate you for this, we'll screen you for this. If you're an appropriate candidate, you could go ahead and, and have this procedure. So again, we are, we are offering this in a clinical trial, but we are also offering uh, 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 this procedure focused ultrasound for patients with um, Parkinson's disease that is predominantly as tremor outside of a clinical trial setting. As I mentioned, my colleague in neurosurgery, Dr. Moik Zucker, he's chief of neurosurgery. He has accumulated probably some of the greatest experience of any neurosurgeon anywhere in the world with this procedure. So we are excited to offer this procedure at Delray Medical Center, not just uh, as far as clinical research, but also as something that we have already researched and proven to the FDA that this is a treatment that uh, can be studied in a randomized way and has uh, withstood that test and is applicable to our patients. So if you want to learn more about this, uh, contact my office uh, and we will uh, see if you're an eligible candidate for our PD014 study or if you are interested in deep brain stimulation, or if you're interested in focused ultrasound outside of a clinical trial setting, also reach out to us and we assess you and try to match the procedure that suits you best in terms of uh, potential for improvement. So with that, I will end my presentation and I would open the floor to questions if people have any. Thank you for your attention. Can start at the front. That is focused on ultrasound. Is that a one time deal or is that a series of? Uh, that is an excellent question because one thing with deep brain stimulation is uh, even though we do the procedure, you do need adjustments of the DPS device. So you have to come back every three months, every six months, because as the Parkinson's progresses, we make adjustments in the DBS settings. So that's both good and bad. It's good in the sense that I have patients who come to me from Chicago, we implanted them when I started out there in 2002, now it's 2022, 20 years out. They come and see me once every six months, get what I call a tune-up adjustment of the DBS device, they go back to Chicago. So DBS in some ways allows us to keep pace with the, with the disease state through adjustments. But on the other hand, if they had a focused ultrasound procedure, it would be a one and done. Once you have the procedure, you get the improvement and you don't have to come in for adjustments. So in that sense, we are able to offer it to patients coming from a distance who may not have the ability to come back and forth for their adjustments. They come to us, we do the procedure, they're home the same day, they're headed back to wherever they came from. So it's a once and done procedure. In the back, sir.
So again, what we are doing with focused ultrasound is one way to think about focused ultrasound. When we were kids, we used magnifying glasses and we focused the sun's rays on the leaf. And because it was focused, that energy was focused on a point, it burnt that leaf. Here we are using ultrasound waves that is focused with a special helmet or a transducer onto that target in the brain. But we are making a lesion, a small control stroke in the brain. So if you're on a blood thinner like Coumadin or Eliquis or similar blood thinners, you could create a stroke in the brain that then enlarges into a large bleed, which would be unsafe. Now, if you're on aspirin or Plavix, Antiplatelet drugs, we can have you hold the antiplatelet drugs for a period and then offer you the lesion and then you go back on uh, and, and have the focused ultrasound done and then have the drug started again. But if you're on Coumadin and Eliquis, it becomes much more challenging. Good. Again, it's, it's an anticoagulant, it's not an antiplatelet drug. So now there are some patients who, have, uh, who are on Zorelto or, or, or other reasons that their cardiologist fears them to be off that medication for a period of time and feels the risk is low, then certainly we can offer it to them. But a lot of patients, for example, those who have atrial fibrillation or DVTs, they're pretty high risk for, uh, they need that anticoagulant and so we cannot offer the procedure. With DBS, we've been able to offer it because we can put patients temporarily on a heparin drip because we're not making a lesion in the brain. We're putting a, a wire in the brain that is like a hair thin wire. So we don't really need, uh, the risk is much lower in patients uh, who are anticoagulants with DBS than with focus stars. Over there, Nelly? Yeah. Um, usually covered by Medicare or insurance? So Medicare, when I say, you know, these days everybody's Medicare is different. Uh, if you're on straight government Medicare, uh, it, is, uh, it is covered through insurance. Now, if you're on one of those so-called advantage plans, then all bets are off. It, it would really depend on the specifics of your plan. In the front? Speak about so the question is uh, Parkinsonism versus Parkinson's disease. And all of Parkinson's is a Parkinsonism. So Parkinsonism is the umbrella. 80% of the people under that umbrella have idiopathic Parkinson's disease or garden variety Parkinson's disease. The other 20% can have secondary Parkinsonism or they can have atypical Parkinsonism. So for example, diffuse Lewy body disease, multiple systems, atrophy, cortical basal degeneration, there's a whole range of these. The big difference is idiopathic Parkinson's disease responds to levodopa. Levodopa doesn't cure idiopathic Parkinson's disease, but you will see substantial improvements once you start levodopa treatment, or even if you use dopamine agonists in the early years, you will see substantial improvement. If you fail to have a clear cut response to levodopa, then the suspicion is high for an atypical form. They all have specific features. So, for example, with progressive supranuclear palsy, you might see some difficulty with vertical gaze and so on. Subtle clues that if your neurologist is experienced in diagnosing these conditions, they should be able to read out which particular subtype of atypical Parkinson's uh, that you have. But the, the defining principle of typical Parkinson's versus atypical is a clear cut and sustained response to levodopa. Okay. Could you comment on AD plus niacin? So again, I mentioned uh, two of the supplements, you know, coenzyme Q10, I mentioned uh, CP1347. We studied these through large scale control trials. We had, uh, for example, in the precept trial, we had somewhere like 900 patients. None of those uh, compounds have been tested in such a way. You can, of course, on YouTube or on um, somebody's blog, you can have anecdotal evidence of something working and being helpful. It's an antioxidant, the theory is sound, but it has not been shown in large scale randomized control trials to be effective. So you can use it, it probably will not do you any harm, but you know, it's like the Prevagen, there's no real evidence for it. Yeah, my name is Candace, mm -hmm. um, I was diagnosed 
like a year ago. I don't see that too much difference between when I take less self or all the Um Is there a reason for that? So again, uh, this is sort of a challenging issue because in the early years of Parkinson's, your symptoms might be so mild that it becomes difficult to really tell the difference. The fluctuations we talk about, the on and off and so on, those patients really know. They feel it before the next dose is due, the tremor is coming on, or they may feel an internal tremor, or they may even have non-motor symptoms like anxiety. But typically for the motor fluctuations to be that clear cut, you've had Parkinson's for four years, five years, seven years. In the early years, you know, I would rely on partly your reporting to the neurologist and the neurologist's own judgment to say, you know, are you responding or not? Because the improvement can be subtle because your disease state is so mild. So I would not stress too much about, you know, you having an atypical form of Parkinson's because your symptoms might just be very mild. That's an excellent question. Um, step one for you would be to be evaluated by a movement disorder neurologist who does a lot of work with EDS because oftentimes a, a little bit of adjustment can again help improve your quality of life to some extent. Unfortunately, because focus ultrasound, we, we have you in an MRI scanner and you have to be in an MRI scanner for you know, the procedure itself. Overall takes about four hours of which about an hour and a half is spent in the scanner. Uh, having any sort of pacemaker, whether it's a heart pacemaker or a deep brain simulator pacemaker, that, you're not able to offer that procedure. In theory, yes. Again, it would depend on you know what the type of cancer is, how stable is he from a general medical standpoint, is he on chemotherapy or not. You know, you would want the cancer part to be really well controlled and in as close to remission as it gets before we can start discussing the procedure. But uh, in theory, uh, potentially he could be a candidate. All right, so I think that I have a question. Go for it. What about when there is a couple and they both know that exercise is good, as you mentioned, but the motivation is lacking? But what do you have any ideas for the care partner who is frustrated by the spouse with Parkinson's lack? And I, I think I had that point in my slide, but I didn't mention it. I think it's really important for the care partner to be very, very forgiving, you know. Because you have to remember, this person with Parkinson's, number one, they are not any younger than they were a year ago. Number two, they have a disease state that causes fatigue. Number three, they have a disease state that causes lack of motivation. So a forgiving care partner who motivates in a positive way is going to work much better than a care partner who is, you know, the, the carrot always works better than the stick is what I would say. One last question. Sorry? Right. That could be a, uh, an issue. Uh, again, we have to check in the specifics of it and how long she will have to wear it and what type it is and so on. But yeah, it's not ideal. All right, one last one. Sir, how do you determine metal parking? Uh, there are stages that we use, the home and ER stage, for example. We also, in my practice, when we evaluate you initially, we put you through a unified Parkinson's disease rating scale. 
Again, unlike cancer, you know, where stage one breast cancer is treated one way, stage four is treated another way. Person with Parkinson's might be stage three at 12 noon and might be stage one at four o'clock in the evening, depending on the medication response. So I would not go so much mild, moderate, severe, but I would see, you know, is the person responding consistently to medications? Are they having a wearing off towards the end of the day? Are they having dose failures and the like as a way of determining things? Go ahead. Yeah. Well, step one is to make the diagnosis. Having a head tremor doesn't mean you have Parkinson's. So, you must diagnose already with a Parkinson's. Uh, my question is can you delay taking the Cinemet? You can delay the use of Cinemet. Uh, in, in fact, there, was, there used to be whole debates in the 1990s should you delay Levodopa? Is Levodopa toxic? I think we've gone past that. My own approach is to start Cinemet relatively early because it improves quality of life, but not to push the dose too high too quick. You know, so start Cinemet fairly early, but keep the doses relatively low for a while. Because right now, uh, although you were diagnosed with in 2019, uh, but I noticed that when I was way back in 2007, Again, one, one other suggestion I would have uh, for head tremor patients, because they often have what is called a cervical dystonia, is Botox injections, which can be very helpful. Botox injections in the right muscles every three to four months can be very helpful for the head tremor. That is the main issue. All right, last one back then. So again, uh, you know, the way the, uh, it's formulated, the way it's available, mucuna pruvians, it's sort of the typical formulations are about an eighth of a levodopa tablet or a tenth of a levodopa tablet. So if you take 10 of those tablets all at once, it's like taking one cinnamon tablet. So it's really going to be a dose response curve depending on how much you take. But the main active ingredient is levodopa. So whatever side effects levodopa does or does not do, at a certain threshold for a given patient, it's going to be the same for Mukuna Proofs. Thank you so much, everyone. I want to thank you so much, Dr. Dowdy. I know I learned a lot. I was taking notes like crazy up here. Uh, and I appreciate that. A couple of things. In the back, we have David, who okay. came. Oh, there goes the microphone. David, um, can you raise your hands back there? If you need information on Dr. Dalby, David is the man to see. He has it on the table by Nightingale and also by Elite's handouts. We have a couple of door prizes. Um, Crystal, would you mind tracking down your door prize that you brought in from Senior Helpers, please? We have a couple of different um, drawings. Nightingale has their own drawing with a ticket. We're, we're going to go through that. But I really want to thank Dr. Dowdy because that, I thought that was really good and helpful. And I think the food that he talked about is good for everybody. So thank you for that. Thank you. For a second. Hold on one second. Anyway, that was great, great information. Thank you all for joining us. Now we have a couple of door prizes coming up. We have two orchids and we also have tickets for the Stewart Community Band. I have to get the red ticket. Excuse me. Um, all right, that's one. We'll, we'll go ahead and draw that. Your tickets are separate, right? Okay. We'll see. We'll see who's going to win this beautiful, beautiful orchid from Nightingale. Six three nine seven eight two. Six three nine seven eight two. Woo! There you go. She won a beautiful prize. 
Okay, very good. Okay, nice. Well, I'm just going to go ahead and draw a ticket here for the next orchid. I'm not looking. There's no crunchy ones. Okay, this ticket, 077357. It's a red ticket, 357 are the last three. Oh, there we go. All right, in the back. I'm going to bring it to you in just a minute. I have one more ticket to draw. This is two tickets. We do a lot of different concerts here, and we have two tickets for the Stewart Community Band, who they do a great concert. It's here on March 27th at the King Center. So we're giving tickets away for that. And the winning ticket on a red ticket, the last three numbers are 358. Oh, wait, is that the one I just pulled? <laughs> is that the one I just pulled? Is that you? 358, you won the orchid. Okay, the next ticket is 361. 361. Over here? Okay. We'll give, we'll give you the tickets. And if you want to talk to any of the, did you win this, the 361? There you go, you can come back for a concert. And I'll bring the orchid back to you, don't worry. If anybody has any questions um, for any of us or for any of the people, um, grab them while they're here. I'm sure they're willing to answer and you are welcome to use that door if you parked in that parking lot. I just want to again thank everybody for being here. Go have a great evening. And as Dr. Gowdy said, get that exercise started. Get those weights in sight and you'll be better for it. Thank you.